Nature Works Podcast. Conversations with extraordinary guests who are working to protect, regenerate, and better understand the natural world. With your host, Mike Weeks. Welcome to Nature Works Podcast, in which this week I'm speaking with the rather incredible Laura and David Hertz. David's been a systems thinker, working at the edge of sustainability and regenerative architecture for over 35 years. And together with his rather rather mesmerizing wife, Laura, who's a photojournalist, they focus on ecology and community projects. And they're part of a team that has developed an incredible system to collect water from vapor. In this episode, we discuss what makes communities resilient through design and David and Laura describe the award-winning atmospheric water sequestration invention we do, as well as discussing other innovations that could be a hope for climate change adaptation and mitigation. They also go deep into their award-winning house that's been profiled in the Apple series Homes. Or is it Home? Whatever it is, I watched the episode and it was stunning up there in the Malibu Hills. So sit back and enjoy this episode and of course if you enjoy it and others please share it with other folks who care about the natural world natureworks podcast aims to provide honest and unbiased insights into how we can help protect restore and regenerate our only there's only one remember natural world just so you know you are being recorded everything that you say will be held against you in a court of law should we pursue any legal action after this podcast (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nice to meet you both nice uh, to you. and you're in the in my home country of the uk mm. right now we are we're up in the countryside buckinghamshire yes yes beautiful part of the world it's amazing yeah really beautiful we're at wormsley it's just spectacular have you spent much time in the uk before this trip a little bit yeah. yes yeah. Mm-hmm. so my english ac- my english accent's not going to do anything to impress you in this podcast I'm pretty impressed. Are you? Oh, are you? Are? Oh, okay. Uh, no, he's not. He can. He he oh, can. Give, it's always just <laughs> English accent. <laughs> he can give a rat's backside. I was actually thinking about um, when I first moved to Los Angeles. Which I'm going to talk about with you guys because I've seen your amazing documentary about your home, and obviously you're in Venice, mm-hmm. which is where I lived when I was in LA for a couple of years. But uh, one of my first meetings there was at the Nat Geo uh, um, building, and. I got in an elevator and I was chatting to the producer who I was going up in the elevator with. And this lady who was in the elevator just stopped and said, I, and it wasn't a Texan accent. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the accent was. She said, oh, honey, I just love your accent. And uh, I said, oh, uh, uh, that's very kind of you. And, you know, I was, it's not like people haven't heard an English accent in Los Angeles before. And then uh, the doors opened and I said, uh, I said, after you. And she looked at me and said, uh, this isn't my floor, but you can open the, you can open more than the door for me anytime. Oh my <laughs> God. Wow. With that accent. Yeah. yeah. And the producer just looked at me and went, oh, well, this is going to be useful, you know? Right. <laughs> but that's the only time anyone's commented on it. That was like the first day I was in Los <laughs> Angeles. I thought it was all going to be gravy from there on, you know, but <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> not. Um, you, uh, so thank you for coming on this podcast. You are definitely our first um architects mostly or architect and movers and shakers and there's just it's difficult to know where to start with you guys because you you're doing so much typically i'm i'm interviewing phds who are very specific like they're working on coral reefs or they're working on this type of regeneration or but um after watching your video on zanabu which i love the name by the way i thought it was a great play on malibu um, and then stalking you both online and finding the the, the water um, uh, weed you isn't it? It's called the, the water yeah. system, and and then your beautiful photography, Laura. Like I was captivated, and I, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I just wouldn't mention it if I didn't think it was good. You, the, your photography at lauradoss.com is absolutely out of this world. Thank you. So I, I'm I'm really honoured and excited to have you guys on here and. Um, but I thought the best place to start is where we have a definite mutual understanding of uh, of the real value of life, and that is rescued dogs. I've got seven of them. <laughs> seven? <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, seven in Bali. Yeah, because it, there's stray dogs everywhere down here. 
and, oh, yeah. and they yeah. get dumped on yeah. us. And so if, if I, I understand that you're going to come to Bali at some point, I mean, you said in the email, you'd love to come to the farm and everything. So um, yeah, yeah. Please, please make sure you're coming ready to take some dogs home with you. Okay. Great. Right. Because I've been looking. we have an excess of them <laughs> down here. Um, you're, you're both Californians. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So you've seen David's some changes second. over the last, over the last. And I, David's second generation. I'm third generation. So it's kind of rare that two native Californians get together and, you know, yeah, well, like there to. aren't many native Californians now, are there? They've all moved out yeah. to different states and the likes. Yeah, we're both and, born in San Francisco, and and I moved to LA a couple months old, and Laura had family in LA, so we both have a interesting history between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But you've seen mm -hmm. an incredible change in in Malibu and that whole area because I went there twenty. What am I? I'm 47 now. I went there when I was 18. It was one of the first places I went to when I left home and went traveling. So 29 years ago. And I went to Malibu and it really still felt like some sort of chilled out surfy town. Mm -hmm. Having lived there for seven, well, lived near there six, seven years ago now. I mean, it's just gone absolutely crazy, the whole place. It's uh, obviously it's a big celebrity place to have homes and the likes but people want to just go there and see it and i tried surfing there and gave up because there were just 200 people on waves I agree. but your incredible home is somewhere I, I i was trying to figure out where it was because i've gone all through the santa monica mountains i've toured all up there we've got lost for hours and i've never seen anything so remarkable as the as zanabu a lot of people have lived in malibu their whole life and have never known this area it's at the very western edge of the santa monica mountains uh up deer creek which is the last canyon in malibu so we overlook this point magoo state park we're at the very very edge of the santa monica mountains it's reminds me of, of early malibu you know rural mm. malibu when i was a, a kid my, my grandfather came to malibu in the late 40s and he and my father built a western town called paramount ranch which is where they've literally filmed hundreds and hundreds of TV shows and movies. And it had that kind of rural feel that is often lost. Yeah. And I'm going to get onto your architecture shortly, David, because the, the, the uh, contrast between your very modern, I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, minimalist, very uh, sophisticated, uh, approach to architecture versus this opulent splendor up in the Malibu mountains. The contrast is remarkable. And that, you know, that's to an unexpert eye. I'm not, I'm not an expert, but w what's the story behind Zanabu? Because it's, it's not your average home, is it up there? I mean, you... it's rare. I mean, it's, and it's definitely, People do notice that they know my work more as a modernist um, and and a less of is more aesthetic. And Tony Duquette, who right. built Xanabu, is more is more. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, it's the embellishment. And but there's a philosophical kinship in that it's in, it, it's a transformative space and it is about reuse and repurposing in a creative way, assemblage. And the origin uh, is interesting when you actually think about my family's historic origin, building a movie town in Malibu, and then uh, Laura and I restoring what is a kind of movie town. Um, but it started adjacent in Tony Duquette's first property, where he had 27 structures that were fanciful, wild, whimsical follies they all burned down in the 1993 Green Meadows fire. I had a client who bought it and I was, I had never also been in this part of Malibu, fell in love with it. And I designed a home for her um, out of the wings of a 747, which was a, uh, again, a continuity philosophically between what Tony Duquette was doing. And it should be noted, Tony Duquette was the only American ever have a solo show at the Louvre. He was an amazing decorative artist who designed furniture, sets. Jewelry. He was jewelry. Um, he was head of MGM during the heyday of films, Ziegfeld Follies and, and Gone with the Wind. And, and so 
Yeah, the king and I in particular. And what he would do is, is, is he hated the waste. He was very frugal. He hated to see all the excess of Hollywood sets. And so he would bring the sets up to uh, his property in Malibu and assemble them. And that's really what we have and what we've been restoring are largely the sets from the king and I. And it's almost as if he saw something that no one saw in uh, in refuse, you know, in trash and things that were discarded. He saw he saw beauty in a satellite dish and would make a pagoda out of it, or uh, um, an electrical spool, and you know, create you know create the most magnificent beauty out of something that we would we, you know the average person would think was just trash and would end up in a in a dump somewhere and um yeah and and he also did a beautiful job integrating into the environment and nature and that i think if there's any similarities between david's architecture and tony duquette is the um the the harmony that they both create with the built environment into nature and they both do such a beautiful beautiful job at it when I was watching the documentary Home, and it's uh, I think it's the first series, isn't it? It's and yeah. is it episode four or five? Eight. Oh, it's episode eight, is it? Okay, I skimmed through them. I did see one that I also want to come back to later, which is some bamboo. It's a great it? series. It's yeah, I'd never, so, I'd never, never heard of it before until I was, you know, told to look at your episode. Yeah, and it's yeah, beautifully well shot. It's, mm -hmm. it's really so beautifully well. shot. The Lenora Hardy or Laura. In, oh, from Bali. In Bali. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. John Hardy's daughter who set up green yeah. school here, who was, which was one of the reasons we originally came to Bali was we wanted to put our kids into green school. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, we, that's a great episode. Real yeah. That. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely watch that later. When I was watching that, your episode, uh, the question came to mind, looking at this uh, reuse and making, as you said Laura remarkable items out of things that most people would throw away versus um, David your approach as a, a a modern environmentally focused architect the question came up for me was uh, I mean really the the only true way to be environmentally sound surely is to recycle as much as you possibly can but that doesn't necessarily fit in with the modern aesthetic you did it with an airplane and it looked absolutely incredible in that footage but where's the where's the balance now between um for instance reclaiming and looking for old buildings that you would integrate versus using modern tools that are probably much more environmentally sound from an energy perspective etc mm. you know there, there there must be a difficult choice for you unless uh, is it is it very obvious to you? Uh, I mean, do you try and include old buildings into your new buildings? Do you try and recycle still, even though you've got probably clients who only want modern, chic, you know, the elegant buildings? Mm -hmm. uh, the the question for me is like, how does an environmentalist who's an architect balance that? Yeah, it's a hard place to rationalize because you know, building is 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 the single largest uh, global greenhouse emitter. So how do you, I started off as an environmentalist, had to rationalize my place in the world as an architect. Um, that's part of a very polluting system. But I think that's where the work is done is where you're in the, the profession. And I've seen the profession change radically with a real consciousness of it. When I started architecture schools during the 70s, during the oil embargo, we're unfortunately not, you know, that free of, of uh Petroleum, but it's a long process, um, and you know we've started the U.S. Green Building Council, which has created lead buildings and analyzed buildings. So buildings are becoming more efficient. Technology is creating more efficiency. Ultimately, I think buildings could give back more than they take. I mean, our buildings now certainly California leads the way in terms of requiring all buildings to be solar, to be net zero, zero carbon. Uh, collecting water, creating habitat, creating energy. So those are, I think that there is a future where buildings have uh, less impact. Now, obviously, if you can do reuse 
and, and, and then you are usurping primary resources, that whole process, which is much better along kind of the embodied energy in buildings over its life cycle. We were just talking about it, you know, spending time here in Europe, the difference in mentality. You mm -hmm. have you have buildings that have been here. We're in a 16th century house of many people have passed through, many people will pass through. So there's more a sense of like the people are just passing through, which we all have a brief moment here on earth and we're really just passing through and the buildings are mm -hmm. static. But in Los Angeles in particular, it's a, it's a, there's a certain simulacra of buildings. There's not really a, 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 a long history and everybody wants something new. And that's always challenging. And then the question is, could you still repurpose things even if they come out of the building? And that's the area that I've been interested in is lessening the impacts. Um, and when we have, I have restored some building from 1905, which is about as old as we get. It's the birth of Venice, <laughs> you know, which seems old to us, but uh, not in the context of the rest of the world. My wife's family home, which is in Hampshire in a little hamlet called Axford, it's got various extensions on it, but the, the main part of the building, which I can't stand up, I'm six foot four and a, and a oh. half, and I can't stand up in the entrance hall. And the door had to be extended because people were smaller many hundreds of years ago because it's 14th century. Wow. And yeah, and there's extensions that are, you know, only 20 or 30 years and all done beautifully and it all fits in. But you walk in and you go, wow, this has been here for hundreds and hundreds of, of years. And it was an old farming building that's just been extended. And uh, uh, But the brickwork is still standing and it's wood between the brickwork. You know, that black, I don't know what the term is, but you're absolutely right. Living in a, in America, I lived in America for six years before coming here to Bali. And you joke about, unless you you go over to the East Coast, certainly on the West Coast and in Colorado where I was living, everything's new and everything has a, you're right, it has a sense of impermanence mm -hmm. for sure. Do you, do you try and persuade your architectural customers to integrate recycling processes or is it is the obsession with modernization too much to try and pitch that no i always try to pitch um i mean i it's certainly even if it's a new build or recovery we're trying to really instill a, a certain uh consciousness on on construction demolition waste selective demolition reuse repurposing um as much as possible and and I think that there's a lot of diversion, even if you wanted to say, you know, let's throw something away, you know, that that there isn't anything getting thrown away because there's a robust infrastructure that's set up to repurpose as much as, as possible. I didn't know that, uh, that buildings were one of the largest or the largest form of of greenhouse gases is that right is that what you said it's true. yeah yeah because so you think about it, not only is it the you know uh the extraction of all the primary raw materials like aluminum starting under rainforest mining bauxite transporting around the world but the ongoing operating and maintenance expense of buildings and i assume obviously in the developing world where also the you you said California is leading the way. I know the degree of environmental soundness and the checks and measures to make sure that any building is also done within a, a very tight constraints of, of environmental um, concern. In the developing countries, that's not the case, obviously. I mean, I'm I, just across from our office, there's two buildings being built right now, and it would horrify you. The stuff that's going into the streams that I've had multiple mm -hmm. conversations with the building manager there, like, bring it over here we'll dispose of it for you we'll get it recycled we'll they just you know i mean they haven't got the the time or the resources or in fact the knowledge of the damage that that's causing it's really sad it's true. especially with bali because you know we've been going to bali for many many years and just the plastic pollution the you know what's happened in the marine ecology the waterways you know it's the culture has been so sustainable for so many years thousands and thousands yeah. of years and such an incredibly beautiful culture um but it's it's having a hard time dealing with the population 
you know, with tourism, especially population and, and pressures, there, it was very sustainable for thousands of years, especially on the agricultural side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the problems here that I've discovered from living here the last two years, culturally, um, there's a there's a sort of um, a time lag, if you like, from understanding the effects of plastic because it's so new here. Mm-hmm. Uh, up until 30 years ago people would literally just throw all of their household waste into the subak system at the back of the house which is the stream system that feeds all of the rice paddy fields ultimately goes into the ocean and that was fine because all of their waste was organic it was all banana leaves and it was human waste and animal waste and probably not food scraps because the dogs get all of that and of course that whole that process of just going out the back and throwing it in to the subak is still a part of daily life for many people not everyone there's a lot of people here in bali who are making strong efforts to clean up the mess so it's a you know we're in a privileged position obviously i remember in the 80s in the uk when garbage was everywhere and then they did a massive advertising campaign for a couple of years and we got it you know california is one of the most progressive places in the world when it comes to environmentalism um and on, and on california one of the things that i know that was very prevalent for me in that um in the documentary about Zanabu or the episode was the fires the wildfires which is a massive issue right now for you isn't it yeah in california and and obviously we see that wherever we are in the world we saw it in australia but um you know i've got a lot of friends that live in los angeles and multiple times they've been at pacific palisades in malibu and the likes but um as environmentalists who are living that close to that kind of problem What's what do you know that's being done in California to try and mitigate these wildfires? Because they're turning out to be a massive ecological issue, obviously, and not only ecological but economical and societal because they're burning people's homes down. I don't really think that. There, I mean, I think that it, right now it's everybody's just trying to figure it out because fires are happening. You know, wildfires always, you know, always happen traditionally in in the Pacific Northwest, but now it's coming into you know unexpected places like Pacific Palisades and Sonoma County and uh, you know and, and it's it's reaching people that uh, are just on the edge of of the wilderness barely you know they're living in suburbia so I think it's waking people up but I think that there's a lot to be done um, to help mitigate or for people to people don't understand how wildfires work and what's going on and and. I think right now people are just trying to figure it out and uh you yeah, know no there are the, no one has the yeah, answers do they and there's no yeah there's no you just can't predict the fire so there, there's a lot of stuff going on but um and david can shine a light on that there's a lot of stuff that's going on but it's so preliminary that this is gonna be around for a while because we have such dry seasons now and and actually the seasons roll into, you know, fire season just keeps rolling and rolling. But just an example of, I think how disconnected people are. I was driving home the other day when we, before we came here and um, I turned up our, our road and there was a woman in a, an RV with a barbecue and flames shooting out of the barbecue, you know, a little portable barbecue. And she's holding a giant bottle of, of, of lighter fluid and right next to her is this giant hill with all this brush. And and I just stopped and I told her, I said, you know, you're you can't have a fire here because it's, you know, seriously da- in, you know, endangering everyone. And she just said, I had no idea. And so there's a, a disconnect, and I'm sure she's traveling from somewhere, but just to see the the difference between my alarm and her a uh, uh, you know you know her inability to understand how uh catastrophic what she was doing could have been and so i just think that there's not a lot of awareness quite yet but it's slowly getting unless getting... you're a californian and then or uh, southern california yeah. there's a lot of awareness because you live affected, with it yeah. and i think if you've been affected by it which a lot of californians have it becomes an issue it becomes something it becomes you know, like, um, what is it, Benjamin Franklin said, you'll never know the value of water until the well runs dry. And that's, that's how we work as humans, I think, on, on a basic level is that if it's not broken, don't fix it or, you know, that kind of 
philosophy. And so I think people are waking up definitely, but um, in terms of solving an issue that it's just, how are we going to live with this? You know, it's not just California. I mean, it's the entire Western United States and with, you know, radical intensification of climate change, you're having, you know, more and more uh, fires of catastrophic levels. Now Mm -hmm. fires have generally always happened. The only difference is that people are moving into the, Mm -hmm. what we call the wooey, the wilderness, a wild wildland urban interface so that there's homes really where they shouldn't be. And that's, that's part of the problem. And of course it's a beautiful place to live, but it's a it's a constant threat and people shouldn't be that surprised unless they create defensive measures and i think there's a lot of interesting technology that is happening about you know prevention fire pretend prevention and fire fighting you know techniques but the simple fundamental fact is that we really shouldn't be having all of these buildings in these areas that are prone to building uh and i mean burning yeah, I I watched a I think it was a TED talk a couple of years ago where the lady who was a was like a geographical anthropologist and she had studied how for the vast majority of obviously human history we've been nomadic obviously we've been moving around and even when we were agriculturalists we were happy to even move when for a any two three four years in a row if the crops weren't growing or or things were changing in the environment we would move we've now we've we've fixed ourselves in these positions and we build multi-million dollar homes and we, you know we've got sunk costs it's not like we're just leaving mud and wattle or 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 a pile of stones behind where it's like everything that we've worked for in this place but it may be that the environment like you say you know we we, we shouldn't be going into those areas the, the yeah i mean or we need to go in you know, with awareness, defensive measures, you know, but the Indians that lived in our area, they knew that, that these mountains burned every season mm-hmm. and they moved, you know, they're nomadic. Other species obviously move. So it's challenging when we put down big roots and make big investments and not mm-hmm. you know, what we learn about Malibu after this last fire about three years ago, the Woolsey fire, it burned about 5,000 you know, homes, but there's generally the, the perception that Malibu is all movie stars and billionaires. But the reality is that a lot of people came out to Malibu uh, when they couldn't afford anything or they just wanted to live closer to nature. And it's unfortunate because there's a, um, a displacement. Yeah, yeah. A displacement of a lot of those people that were underinsured or, didn't have things all the way up to code. Um, that's really changing the culture of, of Malibu um, now. But yeah. I mean, it's amazing when you see fires in, in urban areas, you know, in the middle of Colorado, you know, a Walmart or something, you know, it's just these, these ember storms are really, um, you know, the effect. And it seems like everything that we see in the news is a historic weather event they're Mm -hmm. having to invent um new words you know for describing these weather events and as we have you know planetary uh, systemic change of of fundamental things that have kept us in this remarkably equitable climate zone but that's radically changing we we have had now you know human-induced co2 levels, you know, highest in 165,000 years. Um, These are creating shifts in ocean temperature, which are then changing predictable patterns of the jet stream when now they're meandering. And so you'll have like these heat domes or polar vortexes, all kinds of, of, um, you know, weather patterns. So it's, it's not surprising when you look at the power of nature, of how extreme it can be. And we're really just beginning. I mean, this is just, yeah. uh, we're at the precipice of, of a much more extreme future. Um, and that, you know, we have a lot of concern around how do we not be a self-terminating species, species really? Yeah. My, my children 
I have a nine-year-old son and a seven-year-old son, and they're my world, you know, they, them and their mum and the seven dogs who are off to the mm -hmm. side there. But, <laughs> and they often, they're like, Dad, you know, why are you working so hard? Because Monday to Friday, I I go home for dinner, which is luckily our office here and where I'm speaking from in this podcast room is only 100 metres from our home. We've set it oh. up that way. But I go home for dinner, I tell them a story, and then I come back to work until midnight. And I've tried explaining to them that I've had decades of incredible life traveling the world and being a rock climber and, and doing all this cool stuff. And I've hit my 40s and gone, oh, my God, what am I leaving for my children? Because the company I work in now, you know, we're, our approach to the environmental, global environmental issues is regenerative agriculture. Mm. as well as as well as data sensing systems so we can actually catch this stuff and make predictive models but we're looking at regenerative agriculture all across uh, middle east and north africa in drought stricken areas bringing back diverse diversity biodiversity and the likes and we do it here on our farm um, in on small scale here in bali so i've i've been trying to explain to them the situation globally without also giving them nightmares i mean they're, they're bright kids and they you know everything seems absolutely fine down here but um, uh, I've also said to them that there's a lot of people who are just sleepwalking into this and really just hoping that somebody else fixes the problem. And then there are other people like your good selves who are taking the ball by the horns and, and doing a lot about it. Um, and I, that brings me on to your resilience lab and your resilience fund. Because it seems to me now that I don't know how much architecture you're doing versus looking for solutions to the global environmental issues but it seems to me that you're deep and thick in the fight and really really you know focused on finding these solutions and you tell us a little bit about resilience lab and the resilience fund and the purpose of that sure i mean i you know i've been teaching for the last almost 35 years and practicing for 40 years I, you know, as, as you said, we, I started off and we both have had a really strong uh, fundamental background in, in appreciating nature, both being involved in nature, both surfing and sailing and having a connection to the natural world. And then, uh, you know, just studying our impact on the planet and, and everything that was projected to happen. There's almost like these signposts that were projected or we're now seeing faster, faster, mm -hmm. faster, further behind it, more and more impacts. And we've been seeing it for a very long time. And, and I think we just feel compelled to do something. You know, it's, we're the first generation to have understood climate change and the last to really do something significant about it. That's profound, you know, and, and our window of, of really uh, acting on this is narrowing rapidly. I mean, we're talking eight to 10 years in this, in this decade before we're at 1.5 C and we're nowhere uh, near that. And with the loss of America in terms of the conservative Supreme Court just this last week denying you know, things like imagine voting, again. You know, we're against the Clean Air Act, you know, we're against the clean. I mean, it's just it's just uh, the last desperate grasp of fossil fuel industries, you cool know, that industry. are. In, yeah. an incredibly, um, you know, polluting industry. You know, we we, of course, you know, <clears throat> stoked the flames of the Industrial Revolution. We didn't have perhaps an awareness of the finite resources that the planet has as Buckminster Fuller, you know, called it spaceship earth. I mean, it's the only known living thing in the entire universe is this incredibly thin layer that sustains life on, on the planet. And so I think we felt that we had never really achieved sustainability. There was a lot of talk about sustainability. We, it, we can't be sustainable. It has to move beyond sustainability, either to restoration, to do more to make up. And that's what you're doing with regenerative agriculture systems. But also, you know, it's about resilience. It's about, okay, we have a threat multiplier that's going to create competition for resources. Um, that's going to really be about, you know, uh, survival in a lot of ways. And so how do we 
think about resilience. How are we resilient? How are we adaptive to what we know will be a much more extreme climate future? And the lab came about with, okay, if, if we just haven't evolved as a species, you know, we've had a, a kind of, you know, limited mindset with, you know, let's take coal, let's take old dinosaurs, let's, you know, put them through in a linear system and have this whole cascade of negative consequences, we're starting to evolve. Of course, there's a lot of forces that want to keep that as long as they can because they're huge investments and they need to amortize those for their shareholders, you know, and, and you know, the capitalism requires them to do that. And, you know, the question really is, will we survive the journey, you know, in that transitional shift? I think every, everybody realizes that there will be a shift. But resilience is, I think, the imperative that we're confronting. And then the Resilience Fund, uh, we just launched here in, in London um, as part of the uh, Climate Investment Summit, and where European countries are actually doing things, you know, with the Paris Accord and and um, and are putting their 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 money, you know, where where their commitments are, and. Um, the idea is why don't we really look at innovations, the emerging technologies around water, food, um, energy, and and yeah, and agriculture, but also carbon transformation, and you know which is going to be a, a huge. These are huge problems, but they're huge opportunities, and so we're still optimistic, and like you, I think. We feel like, well, we've got to just keep trying. You know, you can't be apathetic that that I think as a species, we are incredibly resilient and adaptive. Um, and how can we maybe use, have a mindset that's less about scarcity, which it will be, and more about abundance. You know, how can we use our ingenuity to create innovation? And that's what the fund is about. It's about, uh, creating early stage investments in these technologies. And having been uh, XPRIZE winners, you know, we, we really tapped into all of these amazing people around the world that are trying to do something. And now we feel compelled to really help these technologies emerge because that's ultimately what's gonna save our species. I'm gonna get onto the XPRIZE and onto we do and uh, all of the, incredible um work that you've done in pulling water out of thin air before i do is so at the moment are you are you guys privy or exposed to a number of technologies right now that are being designed to help see carbon sequestration or 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 what uh, and I, I ask you that because i'm obviously curious as to what you've seen that you gives you hope or gets you excited yeah apart from your own, because you're going to tell me all about that afterwards. <laughs> well, I think what part of what David was saying is about um, having, be, like entering into a world of people that are as passionate as we are about trying to do something to save the planet. And so um, we have met a lot of amazing people with a lot of amazing technology. Uh, and, you know, talking about, in you know, who's going to take that first step to invest. And I think that it's kind of slow moving, but going to the X Prize, literally in, in the middle of the night, because it's 72 hours of testing contiguous, you can't stop. And so it was, yeah, two nights. And so at one point at like three in the morning, I was watching everybody, you know, working and, you know, toiling and dirty and grimy. And I just had this vision like, oh my God, we're talking to the future right now. And so we're on the precipice of, of possibly making a difference and changing the way we walk on this planet, the way we make our imprint here. And um, we can make a choice to go into a positive direction or into this dark, this dark cavern. Uh, it's up to us. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of um, optimistic uh opportunity in the future i mean that's that's the way that we we would like to look at it you know where um uh 
people are getting together to to really make a difference. But I just want to go back to one thing is that I think part of the problem is, is all of us doing it together collectively. There are a lot of people struggling to just survive. A lot mm. of people struggle to make ends meet. Single moms working three jobs. People don't have, you know, a living wage. How is anybody going to be interested in, about saving our species when you're just trying to feed your kids? So there's an, an inherent problem with the way that people are living from day to day. It's it just there's no way that we can make a change if if of the majority of us are struggling to survive. You know, we don't have, you know, healthcare is a pro at least in the, I can only speak about the United States because that's all I'm really, you know, knowledgeable about as far as the economy and the way we live. But, you know, people are struggling. There's no affordability in housing. There's a lot of people living on the streets because they can't afford to, you know, they can't afford housing. And there's a, 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 a a massive drug problem and uh, opiate problem in, in our country. And there's so many layers, but I, I feel that people are very overwhelmed. And so there needs to be some kind of change in that part for in order for people to have the luxury of trying to delve in and make a difference and do this work. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And look, here in Bali, especially after two years of COVID where people's income was wiped out across the island because Bali became dependent upon tourism. Over 95% of revenue in the island is tourism. And then that just stopped overnight. There was one point when I was looking at the statistics of how many people had come in during 2021, it was like 47 or 48 people had arrived into the country because it was very very difficult to come in they weren't letting anyone in in COVID you had to have a special reasons to come in and so a lot of people who were working in the tourist industry and in hotels and hospitality of, or, or drivers or they've all gone back to their villages just literally to sustain life and so you know we're running a we have three incredible farmers who work for us here but we're running an organic regenerative farming practice next to hundreds of acres of of Balinese rice paddy fields that have always been farmed I say always for the last 30 40 years and we sp I speak daily to those farmers adjacent to us so a lot of them try and give us their land because they on the la per acre they're lucky if they make five hundred dollars a year mm. of busting their backsides off they're out there in the mornings until it gets too hot and then in the evenings and they're also dependent upon chemical fertilizers because the chemical fertilizer companies came in 20 30 years ago and said your yields will go up use all of this fertilizer you know and it's cheap what they don't tell them is the yields go up for a period of time and then you have to put more inputs and more inputs because you destroy all the microbes in the soil you destroy all the life in the soil as bad all the runoff um and i've spoken to now three marine biologists about this they say that one of the greatest issues with reduced fish stocks and dying coral reefs is because the herbicides that run off they block the signals between the corals and so they don't breed anymore and so not only are you destroying the earth you know the topsoil with these chemicals you're also destroying the coral um, but it's exactly like you say people are fighting for survival when you're earning 500 dollars a year at most on an acre of rice paddy fields um to then come in and you know be told by environmentalists that you shouldn't be spraying that stuff it's a very very difficult uh, problem to navigate and we have we've put garbage traps with permission from the local it's called the subac it's the, the the group that run the water supplies and so we put garbage traps in the water and all those those yeah, are right awesome. so and we're in, we're improving those these are everything we're doing here is experimental at the moment because we need to see what works because we want to scale it so we must pull out we pull out about 40 pounds of garbage a day plastic and diapers and all of this stuff and that's not including the organic that we just put straight back into our compost heaps this is all the plastic that goes in bags and gets taken away for recycling and we make sure it gets recycled but the mm -hmm. vast majority of it's single piece plastic you know tiny little things single sachet hair gels or 
conditioners, single sachet, tiny little toothpastes. And when I first got it, I said, what's this obsession with all these single sachets? And a friend of mine just, who's who's lived here for over a decade, he said, well, it's because they can't afford to buy the big stuff. You know, they're living day to day. to day. So yeah, they're going to buy just enough hair conditioner for the one day because that's all they can afford because they don't know if they're going to have enough money tomorrow to eat enough food and therefore three dollars on hair conditioner when you can do it for 20 cents in a single sachet and so these are the sort of problems that we're facing economical societal versus this impending planetary collapse if we're if we don't do something about it so um can you talk a little bit about the the um x prize competition because as you were explaining it and i i didn't i don't really know how it works but it sounds grim if you've got to go two nights without sleep to uh, how does it work you what you come in and then you develop the product in front of the very eyes of the judges or the uh, the x prize is is was set up um as an incentive prize um you know the first one was was you know, set up uh, with the spirit of St. Louis to, you know, do a challenge to who could fly across, you know, the Atlantic. Um, so these these kinds of uh, incentive prizes foster innovation. And the X Prize was set up to, to look at the kind of audacious challenges that are still achievable, especially in, in the, you know, nascent technologies that need to have more awareness of it. And so the Water Abundance X Prize was was generated to try to create a challenge, uh, a global challenge to make 2000 liters of water from air, had to use 100% renewable energy and had to have a cost of less than two cents per liter. There were about 100 teams from 27 countries uh, competing of all scale. Um, What was interesting about the competition as I had been interested in atmospheric water generation before and thought you know we were well suited to this competition but there was a final five and we weren't selected as part of the final five uh and that five was given some money and several months head start and then uh several of those uh finalists could not meet the next requirement so they dipped down and asked us if we would join Join the race but without equalization without the same money and uh, time Time. so we We ended up um, kind of coming, you know, from being a dark horse. I mean, we weren't even in the race and, uh, and we entered the race. Um, we didn't have time to raise any funding. We didn't get any funding. We actually mortgaged our, our home our to, uh, to join the competition <laughs> uh, and self-funded it. Oh, wow. We probably wouldn't be talking Crazy. to you here. Uh, My goodness. When? Uh, uh, but we we ended up uh, making more than 2,000 liters. We made about 2,200 liters, 24 hours. We generated more energy than we used. We sequestered atmospheric carbon, um, and we made water at about 0.5 cents per liter, um, half a cent per liter. And, um, and that was, you know, it was it was all about the renewable energy source because that's where the just didn't work. Um, and I had heard a bit about biomass gasification, which is essentially not uh, low temperature combustion. There's not there's no carbon out of the process. It's essentially high temperature vaporization of organic matter to liberate the volatiles that have been absorbed into it. So if think about a tree. A tree is absorbing all types of things like methane, hydrogen, CO2, and those, if heated up and vaporized, are able to be recaptured and they're essentially a gas and that gas can be combusted into an engine at at a very high efficiency rate and the energy density of gasification is about 10x that of say solar in the same footprint um 
and it just needs to have enough biomass. It turns out that there's a lot of biomass around the world. And we talked a little bit about California and, and Colorado and these other states that have, un unfortunately, due to climate change, beetle kill, a lot of imbalance, drought, drought sustained drought, <clears throat> is we have an overabundance of biomass, which is part of a forest management, fire management. We also in California, of course, generate, you know, the largest kind of producer of walnuts and pistachios. So there's a lot of shells. And so when you think about, let's say, Bali with rice husk or India with rice husk or coconuts or other things, these are energy sources. And you could really liberate the energy that comes from that. And, and, and it's not an intermittent source like solar or wind. This is a essentially a 24 hour a day um, you know, renewable source of energy. And so um, that was really an interesting piece. What I started to look at as a generalist, as an architect, because I'm not an expert and a specialist in these fields. And I think perhaps that was helpful because as an architect, I often will um, coordinate experts in their field. So the, I understand systems and I understand natural systems. And so I was really looking at how can we think about this in a nature-based systems thinking where, where there's a circularity to it and where there's a virtuous cycle. Instead of a linear cycle, we take you know, dinosaurs, we you know, vaporize them, we put them in the atmosphere. It's a linear process that has a cascade of negative benefit. What if this is truly regenerative? What if the waste becomes a nutrient for something else? and it become, has a circularity. So part of what happens is you take the organic matter, you're solving a waste management problem, you're converting it to energy and heat is a waste product. So we take the heat and then collide that with cooler ambient temperature to create condensation and a dew point. And that's where we get pure distilled water. You could also extract cold out of heat for non-refrigerant based cooling. And so the whole idea we started to, to find that there was a, a series of, 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 of beneficial outcomes from the waste stream. One of which is the, the resultant from biomass gasification is this carbon, is a pure carbon in the form of biochar. So the biochar is really beneficial, as you probably know, in, in the soil environments in particular. It accelerates composting, so it's great for co-composting, but it has an affinity for water, and where there's water, there's a perfect opportunity for beneficial bacteria, which then leads to uh, fixing nitrogen in the soil. But we're also finding these amazing other things that we could do with biochar, such as graphene, the making of graphene, which is this kind of um, amazing material of high strength as a fire retardant, as a water filter, as a desiccant that could absorb moisture um, for soil regeneration. So you talk about your neighboring farms that had years and years of pesticide use or herbicides. Well, the biochar is like an activated charcoal, like when you have bolly belly, <laughs> and, you know, it helps. Um, to absorb, so you can put that in the soil, and it will it will be the vehicle that tends to absorb the um, toxins out of the soil, and 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 so it's there's some really interesting things. You you asked earlier about like what are some of the technologies that we're doing with the resilience fund, and a lot of them are, is is looking at well if we've got waste, what can we do? where that waste becomes a nutrient for something else. So yeah, biochar, there's a whole host of amazing technologies, both with graphene, graphene batteries, um, graphene um, and, and biochar as a, a raw material for <clears throat> thermoplastics that are, are replacing as a way to sequester atmospheric carbon in the form of concrete and to reduce the cement, which is very high in embodied energy. Um, but other, technologies are amazing. I mean, there was a company that that we that was part of our, our presentation um, at, at uh, the London Stock Exchange that 
basically take salt water, they engineer microbes, those microbes will pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, it ends up into a residue that's like a powder that's meltable. If it's meltable, now it could be extruded in, as in lieu of, of uh, thermoplastics. So they make biodegradable cutlery. straws, cutlery. cutlery. Um, yeah, and it's an amazing uh, company that's really starting to get significant traction in, in dealing with that, which is you know apparent in those single use plastics that's such a problem in the marine environment, especially in, in, in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. That's one example, but there are so many emerging companies and ideas that are being minted as we speak that we're really excited about. And small things that make huge oh, differences. The barnacle one. Yeah, why don't you talk about that one? Um, there's this technology that we've been looking at that uh, it's it's basically a vibrating system on giant ships, uh, tankers and things like that, that uh, the barnacles, you know, attach to those the hulls of the ship. And they they have this technology that when it's vi when the hull vibrates, the barnacles don't attach. And so uh, with a smooth uh, shipping hull, they can uh, go through the ocean without using as much drag, which obviously saves in petrol and uh, less carbon emissions. So those little, what a great idea, right? It's and an incredible those, idea, yeah. It yeah, seems so it's simple amazing. as well. It's Imagine like, all, <laughs> Yeah, and all the ships in the world, there's a gazillion ships right now, like going through the world, uh, carrying uh, like supplies for us, you know, cargo for things that don't even matter. But now imagine it going through the oceans without any barnacle attachment, really basically saving on so much petrol and not emitting any carbon. And the bottom much painting, carbon. you know, the bottom painting, because they oh, use yeah, anti-fouling paint, which is horrible for the marine yeah, environment. Right. Yeah, um, so, you know, that's yeah. that's an idea that, you know, is, is a massive infrastructure going that is a really simple idea. The energy for the vibration of the hull is actually created um, thermodynamically just by by a turbine as it's moving through, so it's self generating. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of things. It's so that, exciting! Yeah, so and they're exciting. better, faster, cheaper, and smarter, and smarter. <laughs> and that's where you know we think the biggest implementations are going to be. You know, it can't be necessarily reordering the world right, right. away. We understand that we're in a transition between a fossil free world and and i think the fossil free industry knows that you know mm -hmm. it's their days are numbered in terms of this dirty way of doing business but the but we're in a transition you know and there has to be reskilling you know and there has to be de-risking of these technologies but i think it's an incredible time you know yeah. it, it we don't have the time to be apathetic because we're not going to get anywhere i think we have the, this is the time for a, a kind of a great enlightenment for an emergence you know for especially younger people that are entering the world because everything is you know under under the survival of our species is relatively insignificant you know so we're excited that i think investment is starting to look at how do we see these new emerging technologies that could help reverse the the consequences. You know, is is there a future where everyone could be fed? So that, as Laura was saying, you know, that people can enjoy the quality. There's an incredible, you know, imbalance, you know, of, of of power of wealth. But you know, could we actually be a a planet where everybody has the ability to? to you know have food and and care for themselves and i do think that it is going to be a distributed system i think it's not the the path that we've taken towards very large controlled systems is not going to survive the journey mm -hmm. because because they're it's it's vulnerable and so part of resilience is about how do we come up with resilient systems even anti-fragile systems the idea of anti-fragility is interesting if you think about our own muscles you know if we have a certain amount of strain then we build muscle not too much not too little the same with a tree um so how can we have 
uh, systems that actually benefit by stress. And we know we're going to have stress. So those are the kinds of systems that we're particularly interested in, in the resilience lab and the resilience fund. And, and what's really exciting about the fund is that we're building this fund of these technologies and companies as an ecosystem itself, where each company has a kind of relationship to the other. So if the waste stream of one becomes the nutrient of another, you know, where there's cross pollination, where there's fertilization of ideas, of shared resources. That's what we think is really unique about it. And we're really excited. Um, and there's amazing other, other technologies that are emerging. Listening to you talk about your water technology and that process and the biochar and everything, it, it, and you actually, you said it yourself, you're a systems thinker. You need to be a systems thinker right now because there's no singular solution that's going to get us out of the mess that we're in it's a bit like my understanding of bio uh, regenerative agriculture that we can save coral reefs by restoring topsoils like what how does that <laughs> and then yeah. it becomes very obvious that herbicides and and all these pesticides they're killing the coral reef systems etc with the runoff oh yeah do and i've said that to a number of people who've gone oh wow i didn't realize agriculture had that effect on the oceans you know we try and compartmentalize these things but you're you're obviously exposed to all of these different technologies. It must be a challenge to figure out where you're going to put your time and attention because that's the one thing that we all have a limited amount of. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, right now, is it, it, for you, is, it, is water the big or the, or the primary focus and being able to scale up the water systems? Or is, there, is that sitting in this ecosystem that you just mentioned? And so you are, is your job to build out the ecosystem or is it, are you focusing on... Uh, singular technologies right now to get them launched? Well, both. Um, I mean, we do see water as a fundamental hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about in the order of needs, you know, maybe after air, water is there and it is the sustenance of all life, whether it be agriculture or anything else. So, but we do see it as part of an ecosystem, as you said, not because even with the we do the we do is a it, it's it's waste to energy to water to refrigeration you know it can address a small shareholder farmer it, but it's a it's all about point of use distributed systems and that's what we think the future is is going to be is ways in which uh, there are redundant nimble systems that can centralize right that can move quickly because these big infrastructures too slow to you know and too bureaucratic and too controlled for a more dynamic world and so it's about really the democratization of the commons in a way a democratization of water that shouldn't be privatized to us and sold to mm. us by large corporations and plastic bottles where there's more plastic than plankton in the ocean you know the same with energy I mean, if you can just make energy at the point of source, that's much more efficient. We can do that by taking light and turning it into electrons. That's amazing. Uh, and, and that should be analogous to all the things we do. If, if, if we could all make water where we need it, that was maybe even in abundance of the water that we were using, that would be a future that would be, I think, you know, restorative, right? Because we'd be making more water than we'd be using. We absorb more carbon dioxide than we use. We make more energy. We create more habitat. We create more food. That's where we have a world of abundance. I saw in one of your videos that I watched earlier today, a short video about water, you were giving the numbers, the statistics on actually how much fresh water is available in the world. The percentage and i'd never seen it so clearly put out just how such small an amount is available for us to actually drink and use for household and and the like are you, are you able to reel off those numbers again now i'm going to put the video in the show notes obviously but uh, have you got those down pat or am i it's putting incredible. you on the spot <laughs> yeah no it's, it's it's something that i know um because i just find absolutely fascinating if we think about again the totality of this this planet that we're on that you you realize how little fresh water there is. It's it's less than 
a quarter percent, less than 0.22% of the water on the planet is even fresh and it's unevenly distributed. And think about the water, it's pretty obvious that most of it is salt water. The rest of it is frozen, unfortunately, quickly becoming salt water. Um, but what, what's interesting to note is that all of that water, whether it's plants with through evapotranspiration or the oceans, they are going into this closed circle. Water came here from outer space. It's the same amount of water. It just changes its latent state from frozen. But people often don't think about how much water is in vapor form in that stage. And there's six times more water at any given time on the planet than all the rivers combined in the form of vapor and right where you need it. And at the highest point in the, the watershed not the lowest point in the watershed. So it's an upstream, you know, idea. The question and the challenge is how do you get it? You know, how do you get it efficiently um, without using too much energy to get it? But if you can get it on small scale individual needs, I think that that's inherently more resilient because you don't have like Puerto Rico, one hurricane wipes right. out the entire system. It can these things can swarm for disaster. So we see the we do this in a steady state of self-reliance to collectively as part of a resilience and a climate adaptation strategy, and then rapidly able to move to address disaster. Well, I've been looking the last three or four months at the uh, desalination plants that are being built in the Middle East, uh, Egypt, especially, I think they're building some, 18 desalination plants because the Nile's so polluted they're losing so much of the water and they have growing populations and it costs a dollar per uh, is it a cubic meter or a metric ton it must be a metric ton of water dollar per and they obviously need hundreds of millions of this every annually um, and as you're talking about this being in in the atmosphere it <laughs> for me it, it almost seems like the uh, the the leap from petrol engine to battery you know 15 20 years ago before elon musk made it all so uh, uh, obvious and so popular that we would be driving battery cars it seemed like something way off into the future um, but with the growing necessity for water needs and especially in those regions you know mina middle east and north africa where they're having in serious serious droughts and I, I and also in california right in the last decade there's been incredible droughts then technologies like this typically come into play when it's necessity you know because the like you rightly said the old school systems are still making plenty of money from it and they'll just put the prices up and you know they'll go on as business as usual until business can't be conducted anymore um do you do you and i don't want to sound too doom and gloom but do you project or predict a point in the in the future where let's say in California, where uh, your a technology like yours is going to be a necessity versus the current systems there, because, you know, California is prone to drought. Um, I don't know how many desalination plants they've got there. Uh, are there many? I mean, where, when are we going to see on scale a technology like yours, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not a single technology that, you know, it's going to take a multivalent approach, you know, on all levels. The problem with desal, certainly in California, and why there has been desal plants built, in fact, a large one that had been trying to get built for almost 20, 30 years got shut down recently, is that they're they're taking the most valuable real estate in California along the ocean. They're um, hugely polluting in terms of the uh, chemical imbalance for the marine ecosystem because they take in not just fish and things like that, right? But they take in phytoplankton and small organisms, and then they mm -hmm. discharge brine, even you know high concentrations of salt. So they change the salinity of the local marine ecosystem. And if they don't do that, then they transport all that, which has tremendous costs and environmental Energy benefits, uh, environmental consequences. Um, and they're the lowest point in the watershed, as I said. So what people don't often think about with water is it's very expensive to move water long distances. 18% mm -hmm. of California's energy budget is pumping water 
from long distances, right? So at this point, pumping all uphill, which is all energy. So for the, all those reasons, environmentally, energy, you know, the, the stranded kind of infrastructure, because like in Santa Barbara, they've been trying to build desal. There's a drought. They, okay, we're going to start building. Then they stop. But then they have to like rebuild everything that had, basically rusted away to try to get started and they're too slow and then there's rain and then they stop and then you know that that's there there you have long cycles and our our weather patterns and our needs are on shorter cycles Mm -hmm. so to answer your question i do see emerging technologies that are going to be smaller more diffused and i think more responsive and nimble you know, and I think there inherently be redundant systems, which will help. But I mean, the United Nations already says in the next eight to 10 years, demand for water globally is going to outstrip supply by 40%. That's, that should be staggering. And if you look at the threat multiplier of, of, of migration, I mean, most wars are over scarcity of resources. You start talking about water scarcity you're going to have you know a lot of instability you know geopolitically so it's it's i think it's critical that we start to build these systems and think about it even as a matter of you know our own individual security to help our neighbors you know have the resources they need and to touch on your question a little bit about the we do which is wood to energy deployable emergency water it's the acronym for that um the you know they are site specific so do we see a need for it yes we do we see it everywhere but is it the end all answer no like david said there's it's going to take a lot of other types of technologies but the beauty of what the we do or other technologies that are emerging is that they're, they're able to empower people more than say a centralized system where you just walk and you flick on a light. It's so easy, but you don't know where that's coming from. You don't know the damage that it's doing to the environment when you flick that switch. But if you know where your energy is coming from or your water, uh, and if you understand, because what we're doing with the we do is so, it's so localized that the community would be involved in the um, operation or the understanding of um, and the acquisition of the we do so it would be part of uh, of a of a, a decentralized community so you're not you're not so reliant on this big massive central system you're more reliant on what you're doing as a community uh, to create power and water and refrigeration and or not refrigeration cooling sorry um, you know for your very small uh, community. So that's kind of what we see right now um, is how we want to take this technology. But um, there are so many other possibilities out there, but these are just for, uh, you know, uh, just part of, this is just part of the solution. And that's how we see it. And, um, And we're seeing it, the need everywhere. And after we won the X prize, we were getting so many inquiries from so many people from all over the world. It started to get really uh, depressing and overwhelming how many people are in such great need of water and not really being able to do much to help them because, you know, everything takes so long to uh, to scale up. But the the, the need it just to see that understanding of the need is so great on so many levels in so many areas on this planet. It's, it's, it's very eye-opening. Mm-hmm. Well, when I went onto your website with all of the photography, yeah, all I saw was, I mean, you're, you are an incredible photographer and it, it was very much full of uh, the, some of the most beautiful people I think I've ever seen shot in the most beautiful backdrops and, you know, very Malibu and the likes. And, and actually, as I was looking at it, I was thinking, my goodness, this this uh, this photography is incredibly optimistic. It's uh, it's full of life and joy and, and the likes. And and then I because I was expecting to come on knowing that you're an environmentalist and see like bushfires and droughts and people 
you know, mm. struggling and the likes. And that's obviously not the style and the approach of to that side of your business. But um, uh, do you consider yourself an optimist for what we're talking about here, or or are you more a realist, or like where um, where where's your attention in the I, I in the near and I think I'm a pretty good balance of both. I have a I have a background in photojournalism. I have uh, I've worked for many uh, national publications uh, before I got into advertising, and so I I think that the optimism in my commercial photography is a reaction to what I witnessed as a journalist, and um, I I had to leave the world of journalism because I would take on I was so empathic that I would just take on so much heartache and misery and there were times where i couldn't even eat and i can't i cannot shut off that that the empathy button i just can't turn that switch off and so i had a really difficult time being a photojournalist and documenting the hardships i mean i was i was in detroit in you know the worst situations i was in miami in really bad situations and covered executions and you know it was it was really um uh, difficult to just turn the switch off. And so as a reaction, I think, to that uh, pain and sorrow that I spent a lot of years in, um, I, I kind of turned away from that and looking for the beauty in humanity and a more more lifestyle photography. So what, you know, more aspirational, I, I, I want to say, and just maybe shutting off the switch of the harsh realities of life. Um, but as I was doing that and I was, every time I was pushing the button, even way back when I was like, I'm part of the problem, just watching all my sets, you know, getting just thrown in the dumpster and the waste and the plastic bottles and pushing the button and all the travel and the cars. And, you know, just every time I push this button, I would just realize that I have to do something to mitigate all the, damage I've I feel that I've created in this in this commercial world and so um when I turned 50 I just I kind of had it because every every uh company that I shot for you know plastic and nothing's recyclable and made in China and just not going in the direction I wasn't going in the direction that I my heart really wanted to go and so I I decided to just put down my camera professionally at 50 and join forces with David. And we started sky source together where we could, we could actually be part of the solution. And for me, it was such a great relief um, to be part of the solution. No longer what I felt was part of the problem was the, the encouragement of consumerism. And, you know, it, it was great, but there's it's kind of a dead it was a dead end for me because I was like what am I where's my role on this planet and what am I what am I doing how how am I going to leave this place not having done something uh to help to help further humankind so I made that leap joined forces with David and I I really never looked back and we likely think, sorry go ahead David. necessarily utilize all of our skill sets in journalism and photojournalism to evoke you know these amazing lifestyles but part of our idea is as we start to implement these we do's into the community micro utilities i'll put to, my camera back on. right to yeah. document yeah. that you know that's that's what we really look forward to because then we want to tell Definitely. the story about the impact that these has on communities yeah. and i think it's I all know, about storytelling mm -hmm. at the end of the day and how do you want to tell your story? What do you want your story to be about? And for me personally, I want to tell the story of still hope and optimism, but realistic, you know, something that's realistic and, and beneficial at the end of the day. We'd better hope that Donald Trump doesn't run again for the uh, U.S. presidency. The end of the world. <laughs> I mean, oh it's not really, it's not a party. It's Frighting, not a person. Frightening. It's not a politic. It's, our planet is looking um, looking in from outside that the u.s the last few years has just been mind-boggling you know uh, yeah. well imagine imagine being on the inside yeah <laughs> it's pretty yeah. scary evolving. i mean it's, it's scary. evolving exactly it's a dev devolution becoming a dystopian kind of future of everything that we thought was um heading in the right direction yeah. so 
And will you guys stay in California? I mean, you have this incredible home. You live in Venice as well, don't you? Is that right? Yeah, we have a little place in Venice. Yeah. And so will you stay in California? Is that where you see the long-term future? Uh, This place is pretty sweet. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, one word, winter. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. We're not in California. You never know where you live. Bali's pretty nice. Bali's amazing. Bali's Bali. lovely, and we we need more people down here helping with the uh, with the challenges. That's for sure. I never did get from you the number of rescued dogs you have. Is it is it just one, or did you have more than that? Well, we had three, and then oh, now we have we only have we had two. Five time, we had yeah. five, d- then down to three, and then now we're down to two. Um, but we're thinking about when we get back picking up a third. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we look- he does indulge me with my yeah. dog rescue. <laughs> we we absolutely love dogs, and there's no, there's I mean, you know, you have to create some limit because there are so many dogs. Yeah, you know, have so many. You could rescue that if you didn't have uh, some restraint, it would be unreasonable. Un- re- but no, we love dogs, and we feel very fortunate to be able to to rescue them um, as you do. You know, and, two, yeah. two of our seven right now are puppies that were dumped on the office at 11 o'clock at night. I heard this whining outside and I went out and I found these two mange covered, bloated puppies. Oh. And so I took, this was like 11, 11.30. I took them over to the house. My other dogs all got excited and I woke my wife up and said, look, I have to finish my work. And But you need to feed these Do things. <laughs> we're not keeping them. Right. We will we will get yeah, rid of the mange. We'll worm them. We'll get them their parvo vi- uh, vaccines. We'll feed them up. We'll get them f- fat and juicy and somebody. And that was six weeks ago, you know, so they don't seem to be going. My wife doesn't seem to be very motivated in finding them new homes. No. Oh. Good for her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, but, yeah, but what you is... will see when you come to Bali, and I hope you do come to Bali and come and, you know, you're welcome to come and stay anytime. We have three spare bungalows on our property. So, uh, you know, mi casa es su casa. But um, our dogs have never been on leads. The remarkable thing about the Bali dogs is that they seem to be, well, first of all, they're sort of semi wild in that they just wander the rice paddy fields. They have collars on. They come home for dinner. I mean, there's probably one outside this podcast room right now waiting to, you know, they're loyal as hell, but they're free roam. They, they, and they have total road sense. You know, they, they know when the trucks are coming, they get off to the side, they cross the road properly. Sometimes they'll even run out of the office seeing other dogs in the rice paddy fields and they'll stop for a split second, let a car go. And then even in, you know, they're, yeah, they're, in, they're absolutely wow. incredible. So our dogs have never been on a lead. We don't have a dog lead for our seven wow. dogs. Yeah. And you can't do that in California. I know that no. from living there for two years. <laughs> um, I've taken up a lot of your time. It's been incredible speaking to you. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of so far, I mean, I say we have a lot, we've had a dozen people on this podcast, scientists and the likes who brilliant, superb people, a lot of theoretical ideas, a lot of projections into the future, what they'd like to be doing. But it's for me, it's always incredibly refreshing when we work, when we I meet and speak to pragmatists and people who are actually getting shit done and you guys are getting shit done and I can only salute you for that. If people want to understand, know more about Resilience um, Fund and also Resilience Lab and uh, um, Weed You and everything else, where should they go to know more about okay, your so, work? Uh, they can learn more about the We Do at skysource.org um, and they can learn more about the Resilience Fund at resilience-fund.org. Fantastic. And um, we'll put all of, the, all of your videos that are on YouTube and show notes and everything else uh, yeah, uh, in the show notes. Want, and if you want to see Xanabu, it's uh, Xanabu, X-A-N-A-B-U dot com. Yeah, and I highly, highly recommend watching it. It's a, it's, it, I mean, I don't know who directed it, but it's a work of art, that video. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. It's beautiful. How do you take, I mean, it's easy to do because the building is so remarkable, 
but it it blends your stories and about you. Actually, I'll be honest with you. When you came on, I was like, oh my god, I feel like I'm speaking to Hollywood movie stars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you look like one, to be honest, Laura. You know, in, in truth. So you know, and so do you, David. Obviously, but not as much as Laura. Does, oh, so, so. I'm just with one. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a little bit of a fan moment. I was like, oh wow, I was just watching them on you know full <laughs> HD on my big screen. Um, guys, I won't take up any much any more of your time. Enjoy Buckinghamshire. Uh, you are always welcome here in Bali, and if I'm in LA, of course I'll come and look you up. It's been fan- yeah. fantastic. Thank you for your time, and thank you for thank you. The, the inspiration. We'll be in touch. Thank take care. So Bye. Bye, Mike.